We might pass to our last speaker, Dan Oki. Well, he's going to talk about independent filmmaking on the web. Well, he is a Croatian-Dutch visual artist and a filmmaker. Also, he has been teaching video and computer art at the Academy of Fine Arts in Split. He works with various media such as film, video, installation, computer art, web, and performance. Tanoki lives in Amsterdam and Split. Hello, hi. Am I hearable? Yeah. So I'm going to stand up because for me it's kind of strange to sit so straight. I might also move through the space. Uh, I'm gonna, I have picked up some papers and I have some sites I would like to show, actually not so many of them. Um, maybe not show any sites, I don't know. But maybe you, you can? Yeah, okay. So by the way we can show the sites. So uh, I'm actually someone who really loves moving image and I think I started to love moving image when I was something like 10 years old. And when I was 12, I got my first normal 8 camera. And I started to shoot home movies, different kinds of things which were in my surrounding. And then I became a filmmaker. I shot experimental films, documentaries on 16 mil, 35 mil, 8 mil, like the whole spectrum of uh, film moving image, then I worked with analog video, digital video, web. So I kind of tried most of the moving image forms and presentations and situations and productions. So I, I presume this is why I'm going to kind of try and give some kind of a broader scope of moving image in relation to the web. And one of the first things I was thinking of is actually this biological generational thing is like mostly young people are immersed with web and moving image, but there are also people who are quite old. One of them is Jonas Mekas. He's a Lithuanian artist who escaped from Europe to United States and was founder of the Anthology Film Archives. And I think he's over 80 years old and he has an interesting website uh, it is jonasmekas.com. Maybe you can... Is it working? No. Okay. So what is interesting with his site is that he actually has this diary which consists of, 30, of 365 films. And these 365 films basically cover the whole year. So every day has one film. jonasmekas.com I can... Do it? But where is Safari? Oh, maybe we shouldn't do it here. Yeah. I don't know. So... Let's just continue. So let's just forget it. So uh, I basically have three uh, three things I want to say, uh, three kind of little chapters. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speed up now. So one of them is space and presentation of moving image. Basically why video artists are reluctant to put their stuff on the web. So we have Jonas Mekas. Can I just uh, come to this diary? Come to this diary. So basically, this is his diary. And yeah, you can just. And like, I wanted to show his website because for me, he represents someone who was kind of busy with personal cinema. And he's a person who was using a film camera in a way uh, in the 50s and 60s. Uh, young people do it today and put it on a, on a web, basically. So he's the one who shot a lot of uh, American underground scene. Uh, went and shoot a lot of things in Lithuania and Europe and 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 he didn't have a chance to put it online of course because it was 50s and 60s but the, basically the style he uses is the style which 
people use today to, to make these simple videos and put them online. And, and I think it's, it's worth mentioning that, that most of the videos we see today on, on web are actually a repetition of, of some films and videos which were already done, basically. So I, I presume there is no single aesthetics which is related to the video on the web. I think it's all done in different ways before. So I have here kind of like uh, some list I wrote when I was sitting here and mm, listening to the other presentations. It's like, for example, this 50 cent video, like which uh, uh, Vera shot. I mean, it's like something which is in the experimental cinema very known thing, basically. I remember one of the, 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 the films I saw, which was really nice, was called Tarzan of All Tarzans. So this, this guy, Claudio Goulart from Amsterdam, who has took like 20 or 50 Tarzan films and then made them to one Tarzan film, basically, of 70 minutes long. And in this way, it became kind of interesting to see how the Tarzan uh, evolved in time, basically, from, from kind of Johnny Weissmiller to, to Legend of Greystock with uh, Christopher Lambert. Uh, I mean, there are much more examples like this, but I, I'm, I'm going to go further. Like, uh, it's, for me, it was interesting to see Martin, uh, Michael uh, Verdi's uh, films, and I immediately thought about George Kushar videos, because George Kushar is a, is a video maker from New York, and he makes videos in this sense from his very kind of close environment. And then he was extremely distributed on the video festivals and everybody knew George. I'm not sure he is he having a website, probably he does. Uh, and then one other thing is like, I am gonna mention Andy Warhol because he was in his way how he made these test uh, films with personalities who were coming to his factory. So these test, test films are also this kind of direct relation to the personality. Which, which we see today quite often that people use uh, with, with video at home, completely relaxed. So Andy Warhol was a person who was able to kind of relax people up to the bottom and get this kind of film tests, which, which are stayed in the film history just because of this particular reason, which today it wouldn't be the case because the technical environment can really provide this kind of context. Uh, then, like, found footage online, like, it is something which is done by a lot of people and it's not worth mentioning. But I can mention, for example, a Herzog film, Grizzly Man, or I can mention Grimond Press, uh, terrorist uh, uh, documentary about terrorism, or I can, there are a lot of films, so I'm not gonna go further. And then there is this rhythmical montage, which is quite often on the web, this kind of short rhythm-based, montage-based cinema. And these kind of things really exist from the avant garde in the 20s, like Walter Ruttmann or or Fernand Leger or something, you know. And so what I see quite often is people actually use these films, like avant-garde uh, cinema, short, and then they kind of uh, re vj them, they replace them, they recontextualize them, they play with them, they put them other sounds and these kind of things. And it is interesting when DJs use these kind of things, for example, one of the most interesting things uh, of, of collapse of context and that De decontextualizing the film was intolerance of uh, Griffith, which is kind of a, a male stone of American and actually world film history. And DJ Spooky took his film, which was kind of very uh, uh, racial. It was kind of very, and he completely re-edited it and made his own sound, complete soundtrack, and then made a big tour in Africa with this film. So it was kind of symbolic revenge towards American society at the beginning of last century. And then like diary video, which appears today quite often, is really kind of, you can, you can see it with, uh, with Jonas Mekas uh, films. I mean, he's not, uh, maybe the next step would be, maybe someone can tell him, it would be interesting to kind of tag these films and give them completely kind of extension, then it will be even more interesting. But basically this diary film is something which w he was making for a long time. And it's also interesting that he was mm, first seen as someone who was like experimental filmmaker, and today he's much more seen as documentary filmmaker, which is kind of a very interesting thing which happens even today a lot, basically. Uh, 
people use this directness and they uh, do not use film protocols or productions as the colleague said, they just do these things and then someone has to kind of put them in certain kind of, uh, give them some names and then very often they are re renamed like for example Stan Brechage film when he's shooting his uh, first uh, child being born, it's kind of silent film and it was always considered to be like experimental film and today it's obvious it's actually documentary <laughs> it's not an experimental film uh, so then there are these kind of camera based video structures which which uh, which people use today and they were also used before even there is in this small catalog like a Ziga Vertov style which is today also being used a lot of people use Ziga Vertov uh, footage there are whole movements in Canada, in Italy, people who exclusively use Ziga Verto footage and on the basis of Ziga Verto footage they make new films. Uh, then there are this kind of multi-space consciousness, uh, like narratives who kind of break the, 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 the conscious narrative. Uh, people use today a lot when they assemble different kinds of footage on the web which are shot in different parts of the world and they are they're either thematically related or they're image related or, or but in any way there are kind of hard jumps to kind of uh, compile them in, 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 in someone who, is, who wants to appreciate their narrative or their visual drama or something and this is what was also done quite a lot by Chris Marker and I think it's kind of on, on, on the trace of Chris Marker uh, cinematography and what I should also mention, there's this VJ based live thing using different kinds of footages and I immediately when I see this kind of stuff I immediately see about Bruce Bailey which is kind of very underground American filmmaker who is actually at the moment so poor that he was kind of sleeping under the bridges in New York very famous uh, at the time, very good filmmaker and then there are this tag uh, or kind of uh, naming based uh, collections which people collect on the web and on the basis of them they can assemble certain kind of historical or other kind of narratives and when I see this kind of works I immediately think about Godard in the 90s with his kind of history of cinema, uh, his documentaries about Russia, Italy, Germany, so this kind of uh, researchers in the TV footage when he didn't want to have any kind of film production anymore then he just want, went into, into the TV archives and he was searching for this kind of footages and he really kind of assembled unbelievable kind of footages and re-edited them in really such unbelievable narratives that I was thinking it's actually the best thing he ever did actually. Uh, but also it's possible to trace in Godard's uh, first films this kind of referential uh, database cinema uh, comments, tags, references to which are actually jumping out of the of the focus of the uh, storytelling or kind of cinematic uh, cinematic uh, drama. Uh, and then there is one 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 more work I want to share with you. It's actually Eduardo Katz's work. Uh, I even don't know the name of the work. It's, it's actually, maybe some of you know this work. It's a work about this plant which was planted in Chicago in the museum. And, and this is something which I, for me, is one of the most beautiful works. Uh, generally, I really like his work. It's, it's a work about uh, community on the web. So there was this projector. And in order to, to have this plant uh, live, people had to go on the web and put the actually blue sky and light on the plant. If they don't do it sufficiently, plant is going to die. So basically, it's kind of a very nice metaphor of how actually web works and how the communities on the web work. I mean, they need maintenance, they need people who will be kind of patient and, and give, give parts of their life to, to, to provide uh, this environment for the broader communities. And of course, I also think that, that YouTube can uh, can really disappoint a lot of people and, and all the platforms which are based in this way which can be sold as the complete communities uh, sell out thing and so this is this is, this is this part and now when I'm going to, to really to, to the to the art of moving image doesn't matter is it a film or video what I always think as an artist, especially as someone who is working with moving image in all different kinds of uh, presentations and medias, I'm always concerned about how the, my work is going to be presented. 
uh, where the audience is going to be, who is going to be the audience, is it site specific? There are a lot of uh, which kind of architecture it is, what is the history of the space is going to be shown. I mean, I, I basically want to control a lot of context as an artist. And it's not only that I want to control them because of pure control, but I want, actually I want to engage them in my creative process. I want to actually take them as a part of my work because I'm completely aware that my work is related to the environment. Just in the same way as one video is related to the environment, where is it placed on the web? If it's on YouTube, I consider it differently than if it's on, for example, DV blog. So it's like, there are these things which are also related to resolution, which I find very important. Basically, I really like 35 millimeter cinema. I have to admit this. <laughs> and uh, I think most of you actually like a 35 mil uh, image. Uh, because this is the image which can give a certain kind of visual drama, a certain kind of narrative uh, which is not possible to, to get on the web. So this is why most of the filmmakers consider web like strange medium they really do not want to deal with. Maybe they want to distribute it through kind of very long standing downloads, etc. But then there are filmmakers who actually uh, want to use the web. And there are filmmakers who find the web as an as a actual uh, recognition of what they were doing for a very long time and they couldn't be recognized, basically. So I think this is really related to, uh, to the uh, filmmakers who are concerned all the time with cinematic databases, with kind of fragments. I recently saw uh, Bruce McDonald's film, uh, Tracy Fragments. And what I liked with this film is like, it was like 35 mil film with a lot of different images running around kind of story which was breaked. And like I had really to search the, the, the right image for the story which was going on. So this kind of thing I call kind of linear, linear uh, interactive narrative. And I always see interactivity as something which not exclusively happens by click of the mouse, but it can happen by moving in the space, even without any sensors or without anything, just, just in a way how someone moves through the space, it creates interaction. Like, probably as I'm standing up now here, in, in, uh, in comparison that I was sitting here, it's different kind of interaction with you as an audience. So this is this space thing, and, and, and the one other thing is what I would like to defend artists about is exclusivity. Like, if someone is really kind of uh, putting a lot of serious work in some, in some artistic movie image piece, these persons do not let their work so easily out of their hands. So it's different when you make a work which is kind of, you just do it, it's kind of impression, it's this, you send it. So it's like, it's easier to do it in this way. I'm not talking about the quality of the work because the quality of the work is a completely different thing because you can make very serious, long-standing film which is nothing and you can make three seconds which are great. But just this approach, when you give such big amount of work, you do not let it so easily. And the second thing is that uh, people who work from their art uh, actually, they also want to, to get some money out of it. And uh, in relation to get some money to live, they have to make certain kind of uh, contract-based uh, uh, copies. So they have kind of these additions, seven plus one, three plus one, I don't know, 100 plus one, etc. So I do not think it's a, it's a bad thing by itself. It depends what persons are doing, actually. Uh, so now I, uh, so I'm moving out of presentation architecture to this kind of uh, filmmaking process online. I think that a lot of filmmakers use, uh, use their uh, process uh, today online, even if there is no uh, product which will appear on the web. But for example, when you start with the filmmaking, usually there is a script, screenplay, so when some, someone writes a screenplay, usually there are a lot of people writing a screenplay. Today, it mostly goes through the web. People rarely kind of sit in one room as they were sitting before. And they're really kind of making year or two year long this kind of together uh, web-based time, script writing. And then they really come to interesting uh, scripts which are kind of different than when people were sitting in the same room and brainstorming the script. 
because just the, the input is different, because they're in different parts, they have different uh, time uh, relations, there are less eye lines, etc. So, like, it is, it, it, there are kind of two scripts, you could say, one which is written, of course there are those scripts which are written only by, by one person, but usually those are not independent ones, usually they're really kind of hardcore professionals who have written a lot of different scripts. Uh, and then, like, it is interesting to think about editing, like how the editing happens on the web and what does it mean. I mean, it's like there are these things like Steven Spielberg using kind of satellites to edit his images immediately after shooting and stuff, but that's not independent filmmaking. But what happens when the independent filmmaking is that basically, mm, like, someone can use web, uh, with, and if someone uses a video, like DV or something, it's, it's the perfect medium to, to, to send to someone who is going to edit your film. So basically, editor is usually someone who comes in a post-production phase. But it's not necessarily so. For example, if you, if you make a film and you need an editor, the very good thing is to kind of make your footage, and as you make your footage day by day, you send it to your editor. So basically, before you finish the film, you basically get the footage edited. So you can, it can influence basically the way how you uh, proceed to make your film. And I had one project which was called Oxygen 4, where I shoot kind of a feature film, uh, which was shown in the cinemas, but it was also on the web. And what I did there is that I, um, I basically put my uh, film footage on the web as, uh, as a films. And they were on the web on the site. And people could actually edit the scenes. Like uh, people who will come on the website, they could just edit the scenes and put it in the archives. So I could see basically how certain parts of scenes were edited on the web, and it helped me to actually edit the film later because I could see what I really need. So this was kind of an interesting, interesting thing. And then the second thing which I kind of did, which is more kind of character and, and acting based, I enrolled my actors to have uh, email addresses on the site. So people will, on the basis of this footage, recognize the actors in the scenes, and they will write to them, basically. So there was this kind of correspondence between uh, the people who are acting in the film and people on the web. So, and here I kind of uh, got like a really good uh, database of, of narrative and of narration voices, and then I uh, worked again with my actors on the basis uh, of what we got on the web. So this thing we got on the web, later they came into the film because I put them as a, as a documentary commentary of the film story. So they were, uh, they were inside the film, basically. So, and then it was shown in the cinema. So basically, this is how I got, actually, web into the cinema, which it was the 2002. And, and then, like, I decided that, actually, I should show my film every time differently. Why I should actually, I should show it from the hard disk. Why I have to show my film in the cinema that it's kind of finished? And this idea I really liked because when I go to, when I went to different kinds of cities, I always re-edited the film a bit and I, I collected things from the web and then uh, I asked my actors to narrate them, then I changed some scenes. So I had kind of, there's a lot of versions of these different kinds of uh, Filmed. It's like a lot of different things. And, and then I started to realize that actually web can be used in a very interesting, in a very interesting manner for a filmmaking which, where, where is it not, where you cannot see it immediately. Like it's not something you, you, you see it because there are these uh, also very interesting experiments I really liked. Uh, there is one in Denmark where people can actually send uh, messages on a mobile phone and they appear on the screen which is also a kind of very interesting thing, that then suddenly people in the audience start to see their messages. And, uh, and it's kind of very immersive, but it can also be kind of uh, overproduced, because suddenly there are so many messages that you are not looking at the film anymore. Basically, you're just seeing, where is my message? There is this message, and these kind of things. And, uh, and there is, then there are these experiments uh, which are kind of multi-angle, uh, which are done also in Denmark. Uh, there is this dogma group and, and kind of the surrounding which did this interesting experiment that they had kind of a, a multi-angle TV uh, film 
where you can kind of uh, change the angles because they're on four different channels. So the four different channels were simultaneously sync, sync uh, started the film with four different angles. So you could basically sit at your home and just kind of use uh, uh, a TV remote controller and you could just kind of change the, change the angles and see the actors from the other sides and this kind of things on the, on the television. Uh, then there is one interesting thing where, where I also saw kind of potential of experimentation on the, on the web with video. It's actually virtual scenography. Like, uh, I think there are a couple of websites where people kind of have virtual scenographies which are open, you know. So basically they are kind of chroma keyed already, they are presets. So you can use them basically for your video in low res, of course. But then you can put your actors at home or somewhere in different kinds of environments. You can choose it and then you kind of have this kind of virtual scenography situation. And then there is, there is actually an actual film production which re relates to web in a very interesting way because like it is not like if, if like for example, most of you saw film Babel from, from Inarito, this film with, with, which is shot in four different uh, cultures. So, like, it's kind of high production, but of course, low production can happen in a way that you have four friends, and we all have friends in different parts of the world. We now here, we're going to go in different kinds of places. So basically, you can make these narratives, which are not kind of one space related, one country related, one language related, and people can communicate them through the web easily. And in this way, you can make kind of filmmaking community, which, which uh, assembles together kind of long feature films on the web. And, and I think it's going to happen quite soon that people are going to start produce films in this way because they're also very visible. You can see them on the web. There is no uh, distribution needed. You know, uh, everybody has some know-how at home, some equipment, so people can just join together and make these films, and regardless of the, of, the, of the quality. And I think this would be really like a independent filmmaking on the web. I expect this, this is going to be this, actually. So not like video art, because video art is something else. Video art is kind of more impressionistic. It's kind of one thing. It's like intuition, or it's assembling of different kinds of situations. But filmmaking is more kind of uh, planned situation, which is planned on the web, developed on the web. So it's, yeah, that's it. And the one thing I want to say also for the end is actually uh, that we are all waiting for these moving image browsers. <laughs> And we, we are not sure how they're going to come, but I think they're going to change a lot of things if, if they're going to come. So in the way that, 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 uh, that certain faces or certain scenographies or certain sounds or certain landscapes or certain cities can be recognized on the web and that we can basically browse the moving image straight and then we can kind of assemble uh, this means I have three to four more minutes, or I'm over three for. No, you got three, four, four minutes. Three, four minutes. Okay. <laughs> I was <laughs> puzzling. Am I over or not? Um, so basically, this was what I wanted to say. I mean, there is one more thing I wanted to say about tagging, actually. Like, like tagging is a very interesting thing, which, which is kind of something which comes before visual visual moving image browsers because with tagging we are still related to the language in a way it's not just an image and with tagging like we are trying for example if we see these Jonas Mekas films and if we want to tag them like there are 365 films so we can basically tag all of his films and then on the basis of tag we could just not see them as a chronological calendar kind of thing but we can see them like through different kinds of subjects. I'm just now working on a similar kind of thing where I'm assembling my uh, Super 8 films. I tried to make Super 8 films consistently and I'm not doing it anymore. And it's called Last Super 8 Film. And I'm having 20 years of uh, my film footage. And I'm putting it on the web and I'm tagging it. So there will be possible to kind of uh, explore this cinematic database and maybe extend it to uh, what Martin actually told me. It will be interesting to extend it to other people to, to create more tags and see where it actually comes. Uh, 
And the naming is the other thing. Like, there is this uh, Donald Davidson, it's an American philosopher who has written this book, Naming and Necessity, which is kind of this hard logic. Uh, uh, Willard Quine, kind of very, very difficult book to read. But I think it's, it's also quite interesting for web. Basically, this philosophy of language, it's, I, I rarely see it used. People usually use this postmodern French philosophy. But I rarely see people using this kind of uh, atomic logic philosophy, which is kind of, for me, quite more related to the web, basically, than this kind of postmodern social conditions. So I think probably the reason of this is that people who are programming, they should rather read it, but they are somehow quite far from the philosophical discipline. So it's kind of two very far uh, places, difficult to kind of bring together. But I expect this would be really interesting to see how actually naming happens on the web and what is the necessity of naming something as something. I mean, there is Ludwig Wittgenstein, it's a more known person in this area, one of the most famous philosophers of language of 20th century. But I think web could give very interesting, very interesting uh, insights in, the, in this area of naming, uh, of, uh, of actually uh, making uh, decision making on the basis of what, what is someone's intention and why is decision being made in a certain way on a certain site. Uh, so it's not really a moving image, but I think in a, in a question of tagging, it can help uh, moving image narrative to evolve, I think, uh, which is then more kind of a collective. I also strictly uh, have two visions of like people who make their film alone or video and people who actually have a group making one film. Because usually film production is, is, uh, is something which is done by a lot of people together. And, and I think that the web is a really ideal platform for this. So that's it. Well, I would like to thank to Dan, Gusen and Brittany for the presentations. Then you would have questions, comments. Two questions to the filmmaker. Um, uh, for uh, two new uh, styles of, which is uh, of course far beyond uh, serious filmmaking, uh, but uh, would you give them a chance? The first one is with the uh, uh, G3 or in future G4 mobile connection, um, people can make uh, uh, inventions. And, public space and film it with their uh, 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 mobile and, and instantly send them on the web and even maybe uh, work uh, uh, um, collaboratively on it. If you uh, give things like this a chance uh, from the point of view as a filmmaker and on the second one, also really unserious uh, uh, in, if you compare it with real filmmaking, as this automatically uh, uh, created uh, movie stuff, like for example, um, we make an experience with a software that if you have a movie, an action movie, not very complex mm -hmm. and it's story also, but the automatically created film, uh, 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 movie trailer was for advertisement, was if we make tests with, um, with an audience, test audience in cinema and so on, it was the same than the original one, which was m much uh, uh, more uh, uh, expensive to, to produce. And, and now we try to make it the same with advertisement and uh, uh, with uh, a daily soap stuff. And, and so you mm -hmm. just put footage in and, and some, yeah? And yeah, you I mean the get the out a, 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 a sort of narrative. I, I understand. Uh, uh, the, the first one, it's like, it's easy to answer because mobile phone is really used in, uh, in the films already on a very big scale. I mean, maybe you do not know there is uh, Isabella Rossellini film directed by Isabella Rossellini, which was shown at the Berlin Film Festival in, in the main competition program. And the whole film has been shot on mo with a mobile uh, camera. So I think actually that, that, uh, that mobile filmmaking is something which is already quite vivid and alive. And I have definitely skipped it from my... Uh, presentation and I will keep it in mind. 
further time. And I mean, there are also these uh, uh, kind of disciplines in the film festivals, which are mobile phone filmmaking. Like, for example, in Rotterdam Film Festival, or a lot of different festivals. They have this kind of, uh, and now they have also this interactive web-based films, which you can find even in a car. So actually, the, the, the film world is very, very attentive to what happens on the web. And I think other way around, it's not so much, actually. People on the web, are, I think, are not really using the strategies which are in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the cinema. Not only in the independent cinema, but also in the mainstream cinema. Because uh, film is such an industry which, which is very, very uh, powerful, which creates a, a lot of contexts, and which has uh, strategies which are already uh, like more than 100 years old. And they have really like perfect strategies which we can use actually from them. Uh, and the, the second thing you, you asked, I think it's, it's kind of like algorithmic cinema, you want to say. It, it's kind of algorithmic film. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's it, there are kind of a couple of ways to do this actually. Because on the web, web is the ideal platform because you can, you can write a code. Uh, or algorithm and you can search through the engines and you can have a film. And I had a student, uh, she graduated in my class. It was interesting, she, she, uh, her boyfriend brought her a code where she went to her, her hard disk and the name of the film was uh, uh, Wow, I forgot it, something like uh, show me your hard disk and I will tell you who you are actually. So she actually went, uh, you could use this uh, code to go to, to people's hard disks and collect all the moving image and then mix it all the way around, basically, in, in some kind of algorithmic loop, uh, which, which, which is on, on the basis of this, basically. So it's kind of more one computer-based thing, while the web is kind of different kind of thing. And then there are these kind of uh, soft cinema, Lev Manovich situations, where you basically have uh, like footage, which is on the hard disk, and which is being changed and modulated by different video channels getting into the single screen, and they are algorithmically designed to change and randomly pick up the loops, while basic narrative is completely linear, and it's his voice saying this thing about immigrants and the life of immigrants. And this film of Lev Manovich is, is a bit a copy, and not so a good copy, uh, of the film Wex or the discovery of the television among the bees from David Blair, where actually Lev Manovich appears as an orthodox monk in the desert in, in, in the United States. You can see him in the film. And I think Lev Manovich was really influenced by, uh, by David Blair a lot, also in his writings. I can recommend you David Blair. I think uh, he, he's the man who has done the first interactive film. It's called Wex or the discovery of the television among the bees. You can also find it on site. I think it's WebVex or something. And uh, I was just now, I wanted to show this site. I couldn't find it. And, uh, and what I found, which is kind of interesting thing also for you, it's like there is this uh, book where actually uh, David had written part of the book, 100 pages, creating personalities for synthetic actors. Uh, it's kind of a new book. I just, it just pumped up now. And I got kind of searched the menu of the book and it's very, very interesting because uh, David was always obsessed with the idea that a pure rollover on the computer screen can basically have this kind of telepathic imagery so that you can, that, that, that you can show how telepathy actually works on the web, which is kind of far-fetched, uh, far-fetched idea, but it's really worth one life spending on this idea, basically. So. Right, thank you. Could you please just pass the microphone? Oh, right. So, uh, uh, a couple of uh, more comments about some of the, the stuff that, that you were talking about. Um, uh, along the lines of um, old ideas or the people doing them also independently, um, the site Vimeo, before it, its current incarnation, um, the guy who started it was his personal site, and uh, it worked. He had a five to twenty-second clips, 
that he would uh, upload without editing, just start and stop, and he would tag them all, and you could go there, and, and then you could basically sort the, his database of clips, and you could say, show me um, all the clips tagged New York and uh, you know November 2003 and uh, Steve, mm -hmm. and, and then it would assemble them into a single video, and you could sit back and, and watch them. It was really pretty amazing. Um, also, um, a, a lot of people, um, I think, um, early on interested in video blogging were people from um, film and video backgrounds, and um, and part of their th that kind of desire around having some control over the context of or the, how their work was displayed um, resulted in. Um, um, I, I think part, part, partly is why they, we all use blogs a lot, because it, it was social, um, um, you know, software made a, a site that was, um, you know, easily, um, um, you know, linked and networked and all, but um, unlike something like YouTube where you put your work there and it's in the YouTube context, it looks like YouTube, and, you know, has their branding and stuff. This would always maintain yours, although people could still take the video and display it somewhere else or those kind of things. And then, and one more thing about the web as a filmmaking tool. Um, uh, another way people are doing this, and, um, and I've done a, a bunch of this, is um, using uh, virtual worlds or, or game engines to create machinima. So, um, uh, I've made a, a number of films with people on uh, different continents in real time uh, um, as set builders and actors and camera people and stuff, uh, which is a, another way to use the web to do that. All right, thank you. <laughs> I, I have one remark on, on, on your comments. <laughs> it's like what, what I really like basically with, with your uh, videos, and, uh, and one video which Vera showed, the second one of this woman talking, the second, uh, Stefan Kerek, the woman talking into the camera, while incipient is, is actually uh, whispering to her, you know. Like when I also teach at the Film Academy in Zagreb, I teach f uh, directing actors, and there are kind of a lot of techniques how to direct actors. And one of the main thing actually to direct actors is that they do not act. It's like, this is the whole philosophy, which seems very simple, but it's very difficult. Especially on the film set when you have a <laughs> lot of people and stuff. So like what I see as the potential on the web is also in the, in the pure core of film directing. Because you can, you can use certain situations and tools which are relaxed. For example, the way how you approach your daughters and your father, like it, it, it is something you cannot never do on, on film set. You can do it, but then you need to have, you know, I don't know, John Travolta and, you know, this kind of people who really kind of completely, you know, crazy kind of people who are ready to be someone else, you know, because acting is a very, very difficult thing. You know, I know quite some actors from younger and older generation, and acting is a really very, extremely difficult job, uh, very time consuming, and usually, uh, actors are blamed when things are not going well, which is not true, actually. Actors are the only one who never to blame. <laughs> because, you know, th there is also casting. Uh, casting is an interesting thing on, on online. Basically, because uh, you can, this casting agency, I'm having now kind of quick time movies and different kinds of movies. So you can see a person, how they talk, how they act. But be before on these casting books, you could just see a photo, uh, a length, uh, you know, uh, weight, uh, color of the uh, eyes or something which you cannot see on the image. But now you can have the complete kind of showreel of different kinds of people. And quite often they also, they have passwords, so you cannot watch them. It's kind of more closed. But some of them are completely open, so you can kind of see they're basically Andy Warhol film tests, basically, on the web. All right, thank you very much. I, I actually, we are running out of time, and we will have, I guess, one more question. No? 
Sure. <laughs> all right then. Uh, I'm going to wrap up the session, but first of all, thank you. Well, uh, we will have a we will give a coffee break for 10 minutes, but after that we will have another presentation, YouTube and censorship, Turkish case, which will be presented by uh, Mehmet Ali Köksal. All right. Thank you again. <laughs>